first thing, I want you to realize that recreational dating is heretical. It is not scriptural. And it is extremely, extremely dangerous. Are you looking for a general guideline? What's, what's the line? Here it is. Don't do anything that you wouldn't do with your brother or your sister. You wouldn't hold hands with your sister either. Stop holding hands before your wedding night, you sluts. I'm a little bit salty about this because I literally got reprimanded by a church leader one time for giving my girlfriend a kiss as we were saying goodbye in a church parking lot. Hey dorks, I have a new book out on the ancient Near Eastern context of Genesis. It also dunks in the Creation Museum a little. Go buy it. It has a bunch of new discoveries about the biblical world in relation to the Young Earth creationism debate that you won't find compiled anywhere else or in any commentary because the research is so new. I'm not kidding, people are losing their minds over this sick content, and I spent years researching it. What's it like to read my book? Reading Misinterpreting Genesis feels like Indiana Jones and Kara Cooney had a baby, and that baby was you. And then you had a baby, and finding out that baby is John Walton. Reading Misinterpreting Genesis feels like spraying the Declaration of Independence with lemon juice, then following the map into the Sahara and ascending the Lost Desert Temple steps on a beeline to the treasure chamber with a loaded shotgun, while the cute female protagonist you just saved from Marauders with scimitars is visibly developing a crush on you. Reading Misinterpreting Genesis feels like lifting more chairs than the other guys after the service, and having human females notice. Wow. Except the chairs are Bible knowledge about flaming cobra angels and seven-headed ancient chaos dragons, and your muscles are your scorpion king shredded tear hard lumpy succulent brain folds, and also your actual muscles. For those of you that have bought it, once your faces have stopped melting from the size of the umlaut dot infested citation apparatus and you can finally see again, the best thing you can do is leave an Amazon review. That mannequin of Lucy the Ape in the Creation Museum sheds a single tear every single time one of you chads leaves an Amazon review. Every time one of you kings leaves an Amazon review, it increases by 50% the likelihood that Jen Ledger from Skillet will appear in your dreams and give you a forehead kiss. Legally guaranteed. Take me to court on that. I want to look at clips from Paul Washer, specifically Washer's teachings on courtship, dating, and marriage, and why I disagree with some of it. I'm responding to Washer of all people because I constantly listened to specifically him in high school and early college, and his sermons shaped all of my views on dating at the time. No other pastors have more real-world influence over my life. Washer's the reason I've only ever been romantically involved with one person, and why I got married at only 22 years old to a 20-year-old. I walk the path that he teaches, and now that I'm on the other side and have a couple Bible-related degrees, I think a lot of the evangelical courtship movement was dangerous theological malpractice. Young men, I hope that you will grow up. I hope that you will marry, and I hope that you will marry soon. I hope that you will grow up soon and marry soon. And this is why. You want to know one of the reasons for all the immorality? Because you were awakened to the opposite sex, which is a wonderful thing, by the time you were 9, 10, or 11 years old. In the cultures before, you would have married less than 10 years after that. But because in our culture, most young men don't marry until they're in their 30s, they have to struggle for sometimes 15, 20 years with a godly desire that they can't fulfill because they're not married. All right. He just said in the culture before men were getting married at 20 years old, and he implied that that's the standard we should be pressuring modern men to emulate. By the time you were 9, 10, or 11 years old, in the cultures before, you would have married less than 10 years after that. I used to believe this so hard and would take out a lighter and wave it like I was at a concert and shout amen whenever senpai washer would say this. And like him, I used to think modern men are total effeminate trash, hemorrhaging all of our testosterone into an oblivion of video games and microwave pizza rolls, and that we need to man up and aspire to go get mowed down by Wehrmacht machine guns on the west front by age 16. I got hitched at 22 because of this. There's a small problem. Washer is factually wrong. Here's the U.S. Census Bureau data for the median age at first marriage from Angola back to 1890. You can see that in the late 1800s, men were typically getting ball and chained around 26 years old. That seems pretty late considering our modern society is way more technically complex and takes much longer for men to become professionally integrated into. Especially all the years we lose merely dealing with the college scam and its intergenerational economic vampirism. The data I can find for Europe indicates about the same age at first marriage for the Victorian era in England that Washer adores so much. Yeah, men in the USA were briefly marrying at age 23 in the decades following World War II that traditionalists constantly fetishized through Norman Rockwell painting memes, but I'm assuming that's probably just a testament to how obnoxiously affordable an education, buying a house, and landing a stable career was. 
and the decades boomers like Washer grew up in. The 1950s is the great exception in American family life. Uh, it's an anomaly different from any decade before or since. In all of American history, birth rates have been declining, divorce rates have been rising, and people have married at relatively late ages. But in the 1950s, you have something very different. The age of marriage plummets, the birth rate skyrockets, and divorce rates stabilize. The result is family life that's completely different than before or since. And yet, because of the impact of television in particular, this has become the American ideal of what a family's supposed to be. Ozzie and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver. These television shows help transform the 1950s family into a cultural icon, an ideal uh, that Americans have always felt that their families are deviating from. How about the Bible? Well, I'm not aware of any studies on Judah or Israel due to a paucity of data, but we do have this. Martha T. Roth, Agent Marriage in the Household, a study of Neo-Babylonian and Neo-Assyrian forms. Comparative Studies in Society and History, Volume 29. Quote, In this article I have examined two distinct population groups of the first millennium BC. The two populations are socially and economically dissimilar. The first group consists of those persons whose marriages or matrimonial properties are recorded in our surviving Neo-Babylonian legal and economic documentation. The second group consists of persons listed in the Assyrian Doomsday Book by Householder Residents. We can infer from both population groups a pattern of age differences for spouses at first marriage that is comparable to the Mediterranean model of historic Europe. Males typically married in their late 20s or early 30s, and females in their mid to late teens. That's right, men in the Iron Age Biblical Classical period, at least in Mesopotamia, were apparently marrying around the same age they do today in the Americas and Europe. Just casually perusing article abstracts on ancient Rome, I'm seeing late 20s thrown around a lot for non-elite men as well. But because in our culture, most young men don't marry until they're in their 30s, they have to struggle for sometimes 15, 20 years with a godly desire that they can't fulfill because they're not married. To Washer's point, yes, marrying young may give you sexual relief like he says, but I actually don't advise it for most men if you can manage it. All right, first, here's a study on age at first marriage and divorce risk. Washer wants you to marry at age 20, which is statistically one of the better ways to land yourself in a divorce. Because my wife and I were being morally pressured by Washer and the fanatical courtship culture of the Southern Baptist Seminary, we got married at ages 20 and 22. We were little babies. So the median age at first marriage in the U.S. in 2018, for men at least, was about 30 years old. And Washer specifically berates these people that wait until the turn of their 30s to get married. Isn't it fascinating that the age range that he criticizes people for marrying at happens to be the safest? And as we've seen, it's been a favorite for men since the bloody Iron Age. I don't doubt that part of this has to do with the fact that your prefrontal cortex doesn't mature until you're 25. It's way safer to marry in your late 20s to early 30s than his proposed age of 20. The study author mentions that this has been conventional knowledge for decades of social science research. He says, quote, My data analysis shows that prior to age 32 or so, each additional year of age at marriage reduces the odds of a divorce by 11%. However, after that, the odds of divorce increase by 5% each year. When you look at male versus female attraction differential studies by age, we find that women are most attractive in their age range that most corresponds with optimal fertility. Women have the most mate market value in their 20s. Men have astonishingly dismal mate market value in their 20s. Think about it. A 20-year-old male is extremely useless. You haven't had time to do anything with your life. Women don't know if you're a good reproductive investment because you haven't proven yourself yet. You own nothing. You have no technical skills. Your prefrontal cortex hasn't even finished developing for God's sakes until you're 25. It seems generally foolish for most men to be negotiating for a permanent mate to enter into a high-risk legal contract with, exactly at the time in their lives when they have the lowest mate market value, as well as the least experiential wisdom, and the women that they're negotiating with are enjoying their peak mate market value. Unlike Washer, I'm not a religious leader. I'm not telling you what to do with your life. I'm just a dude on the internet. You have to be responsible for your own decisions with the data that's available to your particular circumstances. But for most men, buying into a marriage contract early is going to come at this massive risk that I never see these people even display awareness of while they're trying to morally berate you into an early marriage. Female peak mate value is front-loaded. 
Men's is usually delayed, so be careful. By the way, lads, I'd like to declare that none of this video is some sort of veiled cry for help on my part. When I got married, I was a lanky, emoliated, medically underweight, Calvinistic obsessed nutcase with no real life skills. And I was dumb as a post at 22 years old. My marriage really, really shouldn't have gone well given these conditions. But my marriage is actually going great. This isn't a credit to Washer, but only because I married the rarest, most coveted, wholesome of girlfriend types. A goth GF that's mostly not a socialist. I was teaching in Europe last year, and a bunch of girls came into the auditorium, kind of European techno punk type of stuff. Pretty wild. You could tell immediately they didn't have a father. This next clip is two minutes long, but every second is so incredible that I couldn't bear to cut it down. Buckle up, buckaroos. Prepare to get learned about adolescence. Now, I want to talk to you about the lie of adolescence. Read some things that I've written. Adolescence is a lie. It is a lie. Adolescence is usually defined as the stage between childhood and adulthood when a young person is discovering his or her identity and asserting his or her independence. It is the invention of evolutionary thought and is the greatest obstacle to a child's growth to adulthood. Or adolescence is just something that has spun off from evolution. That there's this period of time between childhood and adulthood where a child asserts its independence. What it's basically saying where a child rebels. Now this, this, this is not found really in human history. The result of adolescence. A youth passes to adolescence where he or she is allowed to participate in the privileges of adulthood without being required to assume the responsibilities of adulthood. Adolescence is nothing more than an invention of false evolutionary thinking. That's all it is. It has not existed in our history. It has not existed in our prior culture. It has not existed in other places outside of the West. It is a fable that has done more to destroy maturity in young people than any other thing. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I'm going to talk to all the, all the young men in here, 18 years and down. Now, don't raise your hand, but I just want you to answer this in your own heart. How many of you would be bold enough to raise your hand and say, you are a man? You are a man. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you would like for me to refer to you as a boy? A boy. A little boy. I doubt if there's very many young men who would stand up in the presence of their own father, the people who know him, know them. I doubt there'd be very many who would stand up and say, yes, I am a man. And I'm also very sure that there are very few young men here who would like being called a boy. But you see, when you remove adolescence, you only have two options. You're either a man or you're a boy. When adolescence is brought into play, what do you have? I'm not a boy, but I don't have to be a man. This is one of the greatest problems in our culture. I asked an evangelical therapist acquaintance of mine if doubting adolescence as a developmental model was even a thing in Christian psychology. Washer's statements are so bombastic here that I figured that he had to be taking them from somewhere. But my therapist friend responded that every Christian psychologist he knew embraced adolescence as a model. So apparently Washer knows more about psychology than psychologists publishing textbooks, and he felt like he had the authority to speak with moral certainty. First, he's dead wrong when he implies that the Bible only conceives of a binary between boyhood and manhood with no intermediate phases. This is a really popular idea that pastors, I remember especially guys like Mark Driscoll and those in the courtship movement would parrot, and it pretty seriously damaged and discouraged me when I was in my teens. These pastors had me convinced that I wasn't supposed to go through or take my time enjoying the basic healthy developmental and social stages teens are supposed to experience. As a teenager, I basically hated myself for failing to measure up to the independence and maturity standards of a full-grown adult based on their teachings. Here's a Duke University doctoral thesis by Stephen Wilson entitled The Male Coming of Age Theme in the Hebrew Bible. It's sort of a traditionalist meme to complain that we have no male rite of passage in modern Western society, but Wilson's study argues that ancient Israel had no technical rites of passage for males either. There wasn't an abrupt and clear-cut transition in that sense. Legal manhood in the Hebrew Bible is defined in multiple places at age 20, so it was actually a little later than in modern Western law. This is when you became eligible for military service and taxation, and you would be considered guilty of immoral choices and actions. Wilson covers this on page 93. Page 95, quote, The age range of biblical boyhood roughly spans from birth to age 20. It therefore encompasses several developmental stages, including what in modern terminology is referred to as infancy, adolescence, puberty, and young adulthood. This diversity of age and development is reflected in the terms used to describe boyhood in the Hebrew Bible. 
pages 139 to 140, quote, With 45 occurrences, Bahur is the third most common term associated with male youth in the Hebrew Bible. Determining the age range for such youths is simpler than with our other life cycle terms because of the consistency with which the term is employed and association with certain characteristics. The close relationship of this term with images of youthful vigor, attractiveness, sexuality, military exploits, and a man's physical prime to be outlined below mark this phase of youth as one clearly advanced beyond those denoted by the terms already considered. Indeed, the Bahur would seem to represent the furthest stages of male youthful development prior to mature adulthood. An approximate age range from the mid to late teens is therefore appropriate, with the upper border at 20 years old, as this age represents the border of legal manhood in the Hebrew Bible. Page 146. This period of life is valued highly in the biblical text, being viewed as the prime of the male life, a time when the carefree nature of youth briefly overlaps with the advanced physical development of adulthood. So I was taught that the Bahur stage basically didn't exist, or it was something that you needed to grow out of as fast as possible. But the biblical authors constantly praise it as the most treasured stage of a man's life. The etymology of the term literally refers to the choiceness of it. Page 142. Kohelet idealizes this period of youth, encouraging the Bahur in chapter 11 verse 9 to rejoice and to be good to himself in this period of his youth, following the designs of his heart and the desires of his eyes. The sage then contrasts the days of being a Bahur with the, quote, days of trouble without pleasure that come later on in life. This period of youth is thus to be cherished, a time of levity, desire, and rejoicing. Finally, pages 153 to 5, quote, Some conclusions can be reached. The first is that the category of biblical boyhood can be divided into two groups. Young boys, those younger than approximately 13 years old, and older boys slash younger men, from approximately 13 years old to 20 years old. Since the youths in this second category lack a fundamental characteristic of Israelite masculinity, marriage and children, they cannot be considered fully men. Instead, the label older boys slash younger men more appropriately fits this group, distinguishing it from young boyhood, but also recognizing that it is not yet fully manhood. You only have two options. You're either a man or you're a boy. Second, Washer's critique isn't even really coherent in terms of common sense. As a concept, there's nothing wrong with people having a stage when they participate in the privileges of adulthood without assuming the responsibilities of adulthood, as he disparagingly words it. There's not really any other practical way for a person to mature. I'm in this stage of adolescence where I demand that people let me participate in the privilege of adulthood even though I can't assume the responsibilities of adulthood. Imagine I got hired in at a new job and I went in for my first week of training. Ain't this a situation where I'd be participating in the activities and privileges of an employee but I clearly have alleviated responsibility because I haven't gotten the hang of things yet. There's nothing wrong with that. Even legally, we don't penalize teens like we do adult men because it's deeply wrong and unfair to view them as competent adults neurologically. Nature biochemically encourages teens to rebel and to try on different personalities and to do dangerous stupid stuff to impress babes, in part because you have to stumble around to concretize your identity and learn your limitations. It's a substantial jump from saying that kids shouldn't be allowed to act excessively immature and rebellious, an entirely boring position held by old people everywhere, to making these sweeping, irresponsible technical claims like the psychological construct of adolescence is a hoax. And I realize now, looking back, that his teachings here ironically made me arrogant in high school. You see, because I was being held at moral gunpoint with this expectation as a teen that I'd be a man, and that I needed to bear all the responsibilities of a mature adult at that age, I felt rushed to view my personality and values as matured, as arrived. And I felt constant pressure to make decisions on that understanding of myself that were beyond my competency, and beyond what I was even comfortable with. This was horrible because so many of the decisions that you make at that age can have permanent consequences. Adolescence is just uh, something that has spun off from evolution. Also, evolution is true. Either your religion is false or your theological framework for understanding it is false, but evolution isn't going to budge and you'll never have a technical understanding of men and women until you start thinking like an evolutionist. Here's something Christians haven't realized yet. When your pastor knows he's illiterate in the evidence for evolutionary biology, yet he confidently snickers at it from the office of the pulpit, he's consciously lied to your face. It doesn't matter that he fully believes everything that he says. He's lied in the sense that he's willfully dissimulating his authority on an issue for which he knows he hasn't earned an opinion. Every hope that Darwin had of his theory being proved... Uh, Darwin 
他要证明他的进化论的每一个每每一个盼望 has been shattered. The human genome is full of replication errors in identical locations to other apes, but not in other species, like the Nanog or Gulop genes. So, for example, human beings and apes are some of the few animals in nature that can't internally manufacture vitamin C. We've got the gene for doing so, like other animals, but it's broken at multiple exons. Why would our genomic complex for manufacturing vitamin C just happen to be deleteriously mutated in the same locations as chimps if the errors weren't inherited through a common ancestor? Why do we even have over 20,000 ancestral dead pseudogenes if we were just created de novo 6,000 years ago? All my life, I listen to guys like Washer speak with all this dismissive moral confidence about evolutionary biology. Then I went and bought Jerry Coney's book Why Evolution Is True in college, and I got totally steamrolled by the evidence. The evidence, especially from genetics, is truly merciless, and learning about it really messed me up. Not so much for theological reasons, ironically, but because I had to come to terms with the fact that all the pastors I trusted and my wise, godly theology professors that were snickering at evolution in their classes were proven untrustworthy due to their religious arrogance. All right, Paul's gonna tell you why you're disgusting for hanging out with girls. You don't even talk to her like you would your friend. Are you in here for me? I used to use this illustration, and I'll tell you, it, it just because it so just points it out so clearly. If if I woke up one morning, say I was first day of deer season, I was going to go hunting. I'm all excited, and I wake up at three in the morning, and I go out to my truck. It's not there. And I'm pacing back and forth five, six hours looking for my truck. What's happened in my truck? And all of a sudden, one of you young guys pulls up in my truck and said, "Mr. Washer, I just want to take the truck around for a while. Here's the keys. Thanks." I mean, it's disgusting that there would be so much lack of respect, and yet you will go to a girl without ever addressing first her father and ask his permission to have anything to do with her. Eleven years ago, I used to think this analogy was super deep and godly. If you weren't aware, young women are human beings with moral agency, unlike inanimate property like trucks. Your daughter wasn't hotwired off your porch; she wasn't stolen, which was the source of most of the moral outrage simulated in this analogy. So it's kind of a dumb analogy. She decided to go hang out with someone. So Washer does this thing where he tends to strip women of agency in relationships, and then he loads it onto men because he believes God made men leaders. And、young men, let me tell you something. If you want to know where God's going to lay the blame, it's primarily going to be at your doorstep, more than hers. Yeah, you're responsible. She's responsible, but you're responsible more than she is. It's your fault. It's your fault. I don't care what happens. It's your fault. You did it. You're the man. You're the leader. It's your fault. You led her in a way that hurt her. This is contradictory because elsewhere he emphasizes the perfectly sane point that until you marry a woman, her dad is her authority, not you. You have no authority. So he berates young men into carrying double moral responsibility for leadership in a relationship, in the absence of any of the authority that's logically necessary to exercise leadership. Like, imagine you had a boss that made you responsible for leading a department at work, and so he blamed you for all of its failures. But at the same time, he refused to grant you any authority over it to actually regulate it. That's what the courtship movement does to young men. I've got a solution. How about single men and women have zero authority over each other, and both are fully responsible for their own actions? Second, any moron off the street would have the decency to agree that it's good to meet a girl's parents once you're going steady with her, and to negotiate terms with her dad if she's still living under his roof. But Washer just summarizes this analogy with the conclusion that you need a license to quote have anything to do with her. I understand that he tries to hyperbolize his analogy by setting it at 3 a.m., but that's just a Mott and Bailey. He literally teaches that you shouldn't be romantically interacting with girls at all until you've jumped through his manhood maturity hoops and obtain permission. Most normal dads that aren't discernment moral busybodies don't hold this position. Most dads aren't interested in micromanaging their daughter's male friend and romantic interests, at least until things progress to a proper relationship. This isn't because they're filthy pagans that don't love their daughters. It's because they respect them. They trust their daughter's ability to choose who they hang out with because they raised them. Your job as a dad actually isn't to padlock your daughter away Rapunzel style and to make her soft and stupid by wrapping her in bubble wrap. Washer goes so far with seeing girls as weak victims that he would rant against sending his daughter to a state college because he thinks it's too dangerous for a woman's sweet darling innocence. 
He says a woman is, quote, never to be wandering around in the world. For that girl's life, from the time she is born, she's under the authority, care, and protection of her father until the day her father takes her hand and puts her hand in the hand of her husband. She's never to be wandering around in the world. Would I actually throw her into a university like yours? Not on your life would I do that. I know what, I know what will happen to her on that campus. I know what young guys your age will say to her. To throw my daughter in that cesspool, there's no way. No way. A bunch of brutish animals. Young men driven by lust with no sense, no wisdom. There is no way my daughter will be put in that situation. Paul, my girl and I both graduated from secular state university campuses. You study in your dorm, you walk to class, you use common sense with who you hang out with, and the events that you go to. It's positively boring. I've never stumbled into people having sex or drunken orgies on my way to class. That stuff is available, but you typically have to actively go out and seek it. And if some guy's going to make lewd advances at your daughter, she can tell him to get lost and keep on walking. You don't let the occasional 19-year-old douchebag dictate her major life choices. Your job as a father is to prod your kids to get out into the world because it trains them to manage their own risks. I don't think this devouring mother micromanaging discernment busybody routine of don't let her get out into the world on her own and don't have anything to do with her and don't even talk to her like she's your friend. Standard of romantic interaction is healthy for young girls. You're filing down their teeth and clipping their wings. You don't even talk to her like you would your friend. Are you in here for me? <laughs> See, the way I was introduced to me was this phrase called guarding her heart. Uh, okay, yeah. And I never forget where yeah. one time I was talking to a particular young woman in the church and someone came up to me after that, had been observing my conversation, thought that I spoke too long, and okay. thought that I wasn't guarding her heart. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. But then I realized, no, this is serious. Like they really don't even want you to talk. It becomes an expectation that I think hurt girls yeah. because now they're, it was the, it was the uh, online dating before it was online. You know, some people do online dating, right? Girls put up their profile, they don't get any hits and they're like discouraged by that. Right. That's, a, that's one of the drawbacks of online dating. You put your picture up and all people have is really a superficial picture of you. Mm -hmm. So they're judging you based on if they think you're attractive, right? right. Well, courtship had the same function. Mm -hmm. It's based on yeah. physical attraction a lot. You end up only talking to the girls that you want to pursue for courtship, and the girls only talk to the guys that they want to pursue them for courtship. Okay, one more clip, then I'm going to do an overview of his courtship model. Another reason is a consumer mentality. Test drive several models before making a decision. Well, the, the problem is this, young man, I want you to understand this. You cannot enter into a relationship with someone of the opposite sex without creating a bond. Even if there is no physical contact, uh, contact whatsoever, you cannot enter into a relationship without creating a bond in you and a bond in her so that when you are finally married to someone else, there's two ways of looking at it. You go to the altar, not a complete man, because part of you has already been given to different women. Or you go to the altar not alone, but with all the women that you've already had relationships with. It's just an impossibility. And again, this is whether there is physical contact or whether there is not physical contact, it is an impossibility. Yeah, I've heard multiple pastors claim this, but I've never actually had anyone attach a verse to it besides maybe Genesis's statement that a man clings to his wife in marriage. Washer doesn't typically reference the Bible beyond vague Sunday school level allusions in these talks. His style isn't anywhere near exegetical, in my opinion. First, this argument seems pretty inconsistent, in the sense that his whole issue with dating is that it's too casual and too non-committal by design. Is wanting to enter into a relationship that requires no long-term commitment whatsoever, so that you can take off at any time. But here, he's now criticizing it for being too bonding in its commitment, and his proposed solution is this other mating model that's even way more committal. Like, this is literally one of dating's greatest strengths. Because it's so casual and playful and exploratory with incremental escalation, it's way less hurtful when you go out with someone a few times and there's no chemistry so one of you declines to continue. There's way less pressure. With courtship, there's huge pressure. You went through this whole formal and scary process of going to her dad before really even getting to know her romantically. And now you two hopped overnight from not being involved with each other to being pre-engaged. How does that commitment not generate a bond that's going to hurt you even harder when you break up? Second, anecdotally my wife dated a bunch of guys before meeting me and she laughs at her past relationships and some of the cringier guys that she was totally in love with at the time or that broke her heart. 
I really don't think I see any evidence in our seven years of marriage that she's an incomplete person because of it, and I find the implied insult to my wife a little irritating. Finally, you could easily spin Washer's analogy here as a positive. That is, yes, all those people from past relationships are there with you like ghosts at the altar, in the form of wisdom. Just as a pastor might commit to a new church carrying all of his past relationships from other churches with him, or a military leader might go to war carrying with him all of his past battles and formative relationships with previous soldiers. It's not obvious to me that bringing romantic experience into marriage is always a bad thing. He literally speaks in absolutes here. Sure, breakups are notoriously painful, but the problem is he makes these sweeping, extraordinary claims without feeling a commensurate need to explain the steps he took to get to them. We're just expected to accept them on the basis of his emotional fiat. And this is why I don't listen to pastors anymore, and why most of the evangelical guys in my generation are now refuged in the secular intellectual dark web. I have so little respect for most pastors as exegetes. They simply don't hold interest because you never feel like you're learning anything truly new outside of this sort of Sunday school level compression algorithm of reality. But I'll put it this way. My wife says that if a man-eating lion escaped from the zoo, it would probably starve to death because there's not enough men in this world to eat. So one of the reasons I teach on biblical manhood is because it's something that's lost. Good luck getting us back. We are much better off learning how to be men by listening to secular guys like Rogan and Jocko and Jordan Peterson. When I hear Matt Chandler yelling at thousands of young men, including myself, about masculinity, calling them boys who can shave, I do not take him seriously because he doesn't know me. And I don't know him. I don't know if he lives these principles out, right? He, he, he doesn't make arguments. He makes emotional appeals. And, and it's, it's interesting that somebody like Matt Chandler can, could really could only gain uh, prominence in evangelicalism where you don't have to make, uh, where you don't have to make very strong arguments. You just have to be good at inciting emotion. But again, preaching panders to a particular kind of audience that responds well to that sort of argumentation and the people who don't respond well or respect emotional arguments but are looking for something not simply more rational but something more utile uh these are the ones that evangelicalism is losing all right so the courtship model that washer presents in these talks is the following i apologize i gotta summarize for the sake of length one he thinks men need to basically become independent from their parents in half a dozen maturity metrics. He understands that college is expensive, so you get a bit of a pass there if your parents are helping you out financially. But otherwise, you need to essentially be independent and ready to shoulder all the responsibilities of marriage before ever engaging in any form of romance with a girl. 2. You need to get approval from your dad or your church to start courting so they can vet whether you are mature enough. Three. After gaining approval from your male authority, you need to find a girl you want to marry. Marriage, 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 marriage. She needs to be virtuous and a Christian, and definitely not punk. And you aren't allowed to flirt with her at all at this stage where you're observing her for wife applicability. If I understand Washer correctly, he also doesn't want you befriending her too closely at this stage, since doing so would basically be a weaselly way of flirting, and that bond could cause her to steal a fragment of your soul forever, or her undead spirit could haunt you at the altar as a result. 4. You seek court with my lady's father or male authority and ask for formal permission to initiate courtship with her. Dad will reject you on the spot or he will initiate a deliberation phase, which includes privately asking my lady if she is interested in you. So Washer thinks women shouldn't have to bear the unpleasantness of rejecting men directly, so if my lady rejects you, the patriarch of the house will summon you back to his court and reject you on her behalf. You gotta get the approval of both parties, at which point the romantic relationship is now formally initiated. Also, uh, according to guys like David Platt, Matt Chandler, and John Piper, you shouldn't even be allowed to kiss until your wedding day. Platt, the president of the International Mission Board, would blatantly rip 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2 out of context to claim that you should never even physically touch your girlfriend beyond what you would do with your sister. And you look, I put in parentheses 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, because Paul says to Timothy there to treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity. So follow this, the Bible ties pure treatment 
of the opposite sex with the picture of the family relationship. Single men and women, what is what does purity look like with your brother or your sister? Guys, would you make out with your sister? Would you passionately kiss your sister? You're looking for a general guideline. Look, what's, what's the line? Here it is. Don't do anything that you wouldn't do with your brother or your sister. You wouldn't hold hands with your sister either. Stop holding hands before your wedding night, you sluts. I'm a little bit salty about this because I literally got reprimanded by a church leader one time for giving my girlfriend a kiss as we were saying goodbye in a church parking lot. Okay, so here's the beef that I have with this mating model. One, you can't really cold approach women on this model, at least as far as I can tell. That's a bigger problem than you'd think because 99% of the beautiful women that you're going to bump into in your life will either be mere acquaintances or strangers, and the average guy gets indicators of interest from attractive women rarely enough that when he does get them, he doesn't necessarily have the luxury of just waving away opportunities. An Eastern European woman in an office elevator once tried to set me up with her daughter and I'm still writing off the high of that compliment about five years later. Let me set the stage. You're at the store, and you bump into this cute European techno punk girl. Pretty wild. Who starts blushing and laughing at all your jokes that aren't funny. Like, what are you supposed to do? Say, hey, you seem like a cool person. Can I get your dad's number? Great. Now you can kiss dating goodbye along with most of your options. You can't just text her and ask her out for coffee on a pre-date, because the romantic undertones of doing so will be especially apparent. And Washer doesn't want you recreationally romancing a babe without a license. So you're left with the only option of this creepy, off-putting request to talk to her patriarch about romancing her before either of you really get to romantically feel each other out, and only met in a store or on a campus briefly. You've eradicated most of your mating options right out the gate, and it's laughably inefficient as a strategy. 2. Unlike dating, which is much more lower stakes and casual, Washer's courtship strategy is intentionally designed to prevent you from having lots of romantic experiences with different women. He outright says this. Another reason is a consumer mentality to test drive several models before you make a purchase. A consumer mentality. And there are probably people here who've counseled their own children. Well, you know, you've got to look around. You've got to test the waters. Never make any mistake about it. You're speaking the words of the devil. This is a problem because it's really inefficient for learning how your personality plays off different types of women in a romantic context, and for honing in on what type of women you're most attracted to and interface with in terms of weaknesses and strengths. Of course, the first time you go steady, you don't expect it to be permanent. Permanent? Mother and I went steady for quite a while. But it wasn't the first time for either of us. What your father means is you'll likely go steady with several different girls before you begin to think seriously about marriage. Oh, well, who's thinking about getting married? A lot of young people do actually drift into marriage without first finding out how they get along with more than just one person. I think I understand better now. Go steady for a while with several different girls. Enjoy it. Learn about yourself and about different kinds of girls. But don't expect too much. Don't make any commitments. That makes sense. Washer scoffs that you shouldn't treat romance like shopping for a car or a house. But the more I think about it, that sounds like great advice. If you want to negotiate for the best car, why wouldn't you do a bunch of research and shop around and test out a few to get a feel for the different models and what you're looking for? God forbid you might even enjoy yourself a bit. Why would you aim to sign a massive financial legal contract on the first or second car or house you looked at, then brag about how wise you are? Especially if you're really young, have no prior experience with either, and are on a really low budget corresponding with your age. 3. Washer's approach is a weak frame for mate negotiation because it implies too much interest too fast. Some basic aspects of human biology and female behavioral psychology, because all of social convention exists to hide it from you. Women are biologically extremely low variance, high investment in their reproductive strategy. They can only replicate their genes a couple of times in their lives, and it's going to cost them at minimum some 16 years of brutal labor each time. For this reason, they're extremely adapted to seek males of superior social and survival replication value. In fact, over twice the sexual selective pressure in our species is loaded against the male side. This, by the way, is why you have twice as many female ancestors than male ancestors. It's why you can see in our genome most males weren't reproductively successful in the past. Nature culls male genes far more aggressively than female genes, as a near-universal phenomenon in nature. All this seems to be part of the reason why a classic trope in female romance and pornography fantasizes around encountering a male who displays initial ambiguous interests in the female protagonist. 
The idea is that a male that isn't obsequious towards women, maybe even negs them, socially proves his high mate value to her by doing so. He's behaving the opposite of desperate. When you jump from 0 to 100, from not being romantically involved with a woman at all, to going to her father and pretending like you're a nobleman of a literal court, then hopping into this pre-engaged status with her overnight, you've obliterated much of the space in which the push-pull and anxiety and escalation of romance that women are biologically cued to love so much takes place. You're starting off the mating negotiation by implying, then proofing through your actions that she's the prize between the two of you, before you've even been allowed to romantically get to know her, which is desperate. Your immediate telegraphing of committal interests is likely to lower your perceived mate value, and it's really inefficient since the superficiality of it is bound to generate a high failure rate due to its absence of a vetting phase where you're first flirting as friends. Last is from my personal experience. I think Washer's model prevents you from having the developmental social experiences that a responsible person should be having in their teens. Embracing the Bahur stage that the biblical authors ironically consider the beautiful prime of a male's life. I know Washer thinks adolescence doesn't reels because evolution doesn't reels or whatever. But because I let Washer's teachings control me in high school and early college, I've always been haunted by a grim developmental hole in my life that I can't really go back and rectify. Thanks for that. There were actually a lot of cool, sweet girls that were into me in high school, and because I anticipated leaving for college and only had a part-time job, Washer basically had me convinced it was sinful for me to become friends with any of them for fear of it being romantic. So I would even have female acquaintances in my friend groups, and the second I would see things turning towards friendship, even if it was just platonic, I would get all weird and start intentionally distancing myself from them. People at school and work used to whisper about whether or not I was secretly gay because of this. And another thing, guys... What are you doing? If, if, I know a lot of guys who say, well, my best friend is this girl. What on earth are you doing? That's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. But companionship of a female requires that you be a man first. Are you just wanting to use her to have feminine companionship or friendship without giving any commitment? Young men, do you have, really have any business thinking about a relationship with a girl if you're still a boy? If dad's still paying the insurance of your car, you're a boy. M boys don't play with girls. Men. Men have relationships with girls, not boys. That first part of the book, where she's standing at the altar and her husband's there, her soon-to-be husband, and all of his girlfriends come up. You go to the altar not alone, but with all the women that you've already had relationships with. That was read to me several times in my homeschool group. The homeschool families took it and said, okay, so when you have a crush, um, you have to marry that first person that you have a crush on. A crush is, if you had multiple ones, were considered an emotional STD and like an emotional fornication, adultery sort of thing. You get to your marriage one day and you're not whole because you've already given part of you to five different people. And on your marriage night, you're not alone. Those five people come with you. And whether you realize it or not, it will affect everything about your marriage more than you would dare to believe. It was very difficult for me because I would get angry with myself over thinking somebody else was physically attractive and I learned to actually suppress um, blushing and other things like that where you really couldn't tell um, physiologically if I liked somebody or not. When I talked about you enter into a relationship with someone of the opposite sex, you enter in a relationship with a girl, that there is an emotional bond there that's never going to be erased even if there's no physical contact, well it's even more so for her. Whenever other guys would be discussing girls, which is about half their conversations at that age, I would just go silent. And it also severely eroded my ability to integrate into adolescent social groups. Like, I used to work at this restaurant in high school, and at closing everyone would chill together in the parking lot. And I would always be the only person to immediately go home because I knew two of the girls had a crush on me, and romance would always be a palpable, motivating force within any adolescent friend groups. So I would constantly feel morally uncomfortable in them. People also thought I was pretty arrogant and weird for this behavior. I was kind of like the kid that stays home and plays video games in his basement all day instead of going out and talking to girls in his peer group, except replace the video games with Paul Washer sermons. For example, just prepping this I could count up at least seven specific instances, I'm not exaggerating, where girls were either into me or just platonic friends. And I pulled the old Paul Washer cold shoulder routine on him. I was convinced it was the godly, manly right thing to do. Yeah. The result was I just ended up really confusing and hurting them. The wounded look on some of their faces is still burning to my memory, and I still kind of feel like a dick about it. Yeah, and you can pretty much forget about classic teenage experiences like going to prom, 
like your parents did or your grandparents did? Since most guys are financially dependent in high school and would anticipate severing with that girlfriend for college relocation anyways, how's that one for Trad? During this whole period of my life, all I could think about was manning up and jumping through all of Washer's maturity hoops as fast as possible, taking jobs I didn't really want in high school for it, and taking a full-time third shift job while being full-time in college, and feeling pressured to get married as fast as possible to fix the problem of being single, so I could fast-track to being a wage slave for the rest of my life, supporting an entire family like the 1960s vision of the traditional family all those Prager University videos try to bully men into. My Bible college friends were under the exact same pressure, and I never paused to consider that maybe there are certain things that I was supposed to be practicing and learning that aren't meant to be rushed in my teens. And maybe being single and dependent on my parents isn't an urgent problem that needs to be fixed and a sign that I'm a little boy, not a real man. Bottom line is, I don't think the pastors behind the courtship and purity movement were reflecting deeply on the complex environmental and historical conditions that gave rise to the sophisticated social forms of Iron Age Levantine tribal culture, or Levitical mating law, then abstracting principles from there, then interpolating those principles into our extremely dissimilar contexts, and then had the wisdom to excise the maladaptive anachronisms. Rather, these pastors have their own cultural assumptions. They go into the text, they wave away the biblical family slave law, like those God prescribes right after giving the Ten Commandments. They wave away the polygamy, which by the way is never condemned as adultery in Old Testament law and is still practiced by Bedouin today. They wave away the warrior breeding ethic of tribal society. Modern Bedouin in Psalm 127 both cite breeding male warriors as their main motive for having lots of kids. They wave away leveret marriage law and bridal payments, and the modesty schneff nose rings like the one given to Rebecca upon her engagement, and still worn by modern Bedouin women. They wave away modesty veiling and the concubinage system and war brides, which also weren't condemned but were regulated in Deuteronomy and Exodus chapters 21, and the family inheritance system. And they ignore the radically different divorce legal rights and incentives in the ancient world. And the austerity of tribal law in a resource-scarce environment and its concomitant family, military, and social obligations. And its extreme restrictions on women. Then they look at what courtship looked like among the financial tribal elite that are described in the Bible, but only in a few brief descriptions. As far as I can tell, they then simply cherry-pick the aspects that feel noble and cute to them, based on their own post-Victorian biases. There's really no reason to overthink this. I think moral feelings were overwhelmingly the guiding interpretive methodology of the courtship movement. Paul, if you see this video, I'll be as direct with you as you enjoy being with young men. I want you to know that because you allowed yourself to be a puppet of this mainstream cultural fad in the first decade of the 2000s, you have caused me very, very substantial damage throughout my life, too personal for me to detail publicly. You robbed me of the enjoyment of and from having the proper developmental experiences of my precious single years. I can never go back and do them over. You caused me tremendous discouragement and misunderstanding with your ridiculously unscientific disparagement of adolescence in the name of the Bible. I see now that you also gravely endangered me with your stupid exhortations that I get married before my physical brain or personality had even developed. I came to you for guidance as a young man because I respected you. And I deeply, deeply wanted to get things right and to honor God. So I did what nature has urged young men to do for thousands of years. And I submitted to the wisdom of my religious elders so I could learn how to be a man. I think Heart Cry Ministries should have the humility to weigh the decade of criticism and case studies that Harris' book has generated. And consider what they can do to prevent causing further harm to people. Every time I bring up this topic, my inbox is flooded with people sharing their own life stories of all the damage and suffering the courtship movement caused on them. And I want to invite my viewers in the comments of this video to please share your own stories. Maybe it'll help get through to these people that subjected us to these teachings. There's a technological revolution. It's a deep one. The technological revolution is online video and audio, immediately accessible to everyone all over the world. And it might be even deeper than the original Gutenberg revolution because it isn't obvious how many people can read, but lots of people can listen. Recreational dating is heretical. Pretty wild. Wow. Would you make out with your sister? Pretty wild. Extremely, extremely dangerous. 
Stop holding hands before your wedding night. Yes, let's.